Hello everyone and welcome to this week's episode of Social Work Radio with me, your host Vince Peart. Once again and always, we are joined by our co-host Tilly Baden. Tilly my friend, how the devil are you? How have things been since you were last aboard the good ship SWR? Hello everyone. Well, welcome to our writer's retreat. We are here again live in Birmingham and we've had a really good weekend. We went to see the Friends exhibition yesterday at the NEC um, and got to go around all the sets, look at the costumes. It was a really good night, wasn't it? We had a good time. Yeah, yeah. People can check out our social media. If you want to see some images of you, I, our boss at the Good Ship SWR, Nick Farrah, and uh, our mystery columnist. I know. You won't, see, you, you won't see their face. You won't, no. So if there's a blacked out picture of some some person, it, she is with no, us. It's not She's a child. It's not a child. Because you would do that if you were like celebrities to black out the picture of a child. They do, yeah. It's not, we haven't taken a child. No. It's not no. some sort of like, uh, we're not, we haven't taken a child for a residential weekend. <laughs> no, that would be very you inappropriate. Like, you've got a social worker, why not have three? <laughs> that hasn't got a set up, has it? Come to Bert, you would probably be struck off for that. You in fact, I, did, I wrote an article for the website not so long ago about a foster carer who was, uh, no, a social worker who was struck off for continuously trying to take a child from foster care. We haven't done that. No. It's not no a child, children. It's an adult. It's an adult. We've it, taken an adult yeah, from. Yeah, consensual adult. We didn't kidnap. We haven't even taken it because if you say taken her from, that implies a degree of like, you know. Yeah, no. She was fully. Fully was, consensual. Fully fine. We had a, a, an adult person with us and it was fully allowed what we did with them take them <laughs> did with them we just went by the friends exhibition nothing I'm gonna say, I mean, what i'm explaining is you know because if i was if i was look if i was looking on a on a, on a if i was looking on a, on a social work news's website and there, there are others out there, not as good as us but there are others out there and I saw, oh, this is a bit of an unusual position. You've got, I know him, I know her, I know her. Why is there a little blackout? <laughs> and mean, I'm explaining why there's a little blackout. Yeah, because our, our columnist untoward. is... A, no, she's anonymous. So and You see, I, see I, was, I was intentionally not sexing them. You've now sexed them. I think... Considering there are how many women on this planet, I think it's safe to say she's a woman. Eighty percent of uh, social workers are female. I, th- I think we're okay with that. Gi- you've you've given the go away. Uh, that I'm sure she's okay with re- revealing that. She's well, you keep saying it, though. Don't keep you, you keep the fact you keep saying. That. Well, I've said it once. So yeah, yeah, that, like, that's what <laughs> people might have forgotten, but because you're, you're embedding it now, people are remembering that's the thing. There was just there was a blackout person who came with us, and it's all above board, which makes it sound like it's not, but it genuinely is. I would if I'd seen that. If I'd seen a blackout person on it, he wasn't even social work. If I was, if I was on the Guardian, if I was on the right, I'll put it this way, and right, okay, I'm following the Guardian. Oh, here's the Guardian's uh, sports desk out for a little trip. All right, well, yeah, there's economist, there's economist, there's the manager. Why is there a little blackout there as well? Why indeed? And and that, and that is the question <laughs> I would ask. So we've clarified that now. We have it clarified was consensual, it. it's not untoward. Um as far as I know, they have got right to remain status and right to be employed in this country. So it's not like it's not an HM and there's no tax investigation or anything like that going on. They just would rather not their image not shared on, on a public platform. That's a fair enough explanation, I think. Something I but didn't feel the need to clarify, but we have. We haven't. Whether you wanted it or not, we've clarified. You would question it. But yeah, good time was had by it all. Was. Even you, who I wasn't sure about the Friends, you, whether you were a Friends fan or not, because Vince doesn't like sitcoms because he finds the laughs annoying. I just say I, do, I don't like forced laughs. I know you don't, but Can't Friends laugh, is full yeah. of it. Imagine if we had that on the podcast. Oh, 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 oh. Do you know what? If, if every time I made a quip, oh, 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 canned laughter in the background. At least someone would be laughing. Your mum laughs. Your mum laughs. And this is coming on, coming on to our reviews, listeners. This is the thing. Tilly thinks she can outwit me, but you can't, out, you can't outwit a witter. 
Um, so, we've had a couple of reviews in this week, haven't we, Dilly? Haven't we? We've had two reviews in this week, haven't we, Dilly? <sighs> yes, we have. And someone I'm was, so sorry. <laughs> and someone was, someone was laughing, weren't they, Tilly? Someone was they, having a laugh. They did. She did laugh. So, listeners, we've had two reviews in this week. Our first one comes from Carol Baden, a lady particularly close to one of our... Uh, not the blackout lady and not the boss, but you. Indeed. Well, I've said lady, blackout lady now, haven't I? So I've given it away. Oh, move on, move on. Um, yes, Carol is my mum. And she so has we got given a review. us a review. We got a review from Carolyn after last week's show. Carol said, I still don't know whether to be amazed or mortified that you gave me a shout out on your podcast this week. Well, we're doubling up on that one, Carol. So you're either going to be double mortified or double amazed. Uh, not quite sure what SDIs have to do with social work. Well, Carol, I explained what they have to do with social work, and I explained that I'm I'm condom card trained. So, you know, we'll have a chat in person, but I'll explain. It was funny. It was funny. It was funny. She hasn't said it multiple times. That's me saying it multiple times. It was funny, but didn't know what to think when Vince said about the wood. I had to cover Lola's ears. Lola's no. a dog. Yes, Lola's not a child. No. <laughs> no, no, no. She's not subjecting any child to inappropriate listening. But mm. Lola, my little black Labrador, she she's too innocent. And and your content last week. But Carol laughed. Oh, what, I, what I've read in that, I I just blank out everything else, and I've just read it was funny, and that's all right with me. Okay. We've had another. We've had another review in from right. uh, Diana. Not- Diana UK, one of our listeners. Thank you ever so much, Diana, for sending this in on Friday. The title is Thank You for Being You. So, so refreshing and affirming to listen to you, your humanity, your beautiful social work values and your banter. I am often cringing with Tilly and appreciate the humour of Vince. Your podcasts, this one and the last one, have really helped me to stay focused on why I am a social worker and reminded me to be more determined to remember what is important. The children, the adults around them whom I'm privileged to walk alongside and support. I love my job and I'm really proud of how I can sit with people with such love, compassion and kindness, which earns me the respect to be able to gently ask the difficult questions I need to, which enables me to be able to truly make a difference. Lovely words from Diana UK. Yeah, lovely review. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Diana. Thank you, Carol. So... I don't think there's going to be any humour in today's show. No. I don't think there is going to be a sombre, a sombre one. This week, guys, we are talking about Lucy Letby. Um, Most of you guys listening in the UK will very, very likely have heard of this story. Um, Lucy Letby um, was a nurse in a neonatal intensive care unit in Chester. She was on trial for the murder of seven babies and attempted murder of 10, with 15 counts of attempted murder between 2015 and 2016. Last week, she was convicted of murdering seven babies and charged with seven counts of attempted murder. She's been given a whole life term imprisonment. She qualified as a children's nurse in the University of Chester in 2011, and these murders started happening four years later. Um, To put this into context of the kind of numbers we're talking about here in relation to children and how many people this kind of topic will affect, one in seven of all babies born in the United Kingdom will require neonatal care. Now let's compare that to social work. Only one, I say only one in ten, but compared to that, one in ten children will be in contact with children's services at any one time in the UK. So... Babies are 30% more likely to be involved in neonatal care, which is where these attempted murders and murders happen by Letby, than they are to be involved in children's social work. The reason we're tackling this topic today is twofold. Firstly, as we'll discuss on the podcast, there are similarities and there are things that we can draw around in relation to what Letby did, her situation in social work parallels. As well as that, 
Um, last week, and there's an article of this over on mysocialworknews.com, last week, BASWA, the British Association of Social Workers, put out uh, a press release. They wrote an open letter explaining that there should be a multi-agency approach to matters like this because where these things happen, uh, BASWA believe or um, state that Clinicians, I'm just reading this out there. Basra said many clinicians were concerned by the, that the hospital, but were not heard within the institution. Hospitals too often still operate as closed units and cultural norms can obscure evidence that harm is happening. Anyone concerned about child welfare must be able to raise the alarm outside the institution. So Basra essentially said there was a social work role here. So we're going to explore this today for two reasons. Firstly, because of the parallels it has to social work, which we'll get into. And secondly, because Basra, our association, you're a Basra member, are you not, Tilly? So am I. Um, and yeah. most of our listeners, I imagine, will be or may have at least been involved with them at some point, given they've got 22,000 members in the UK. It's a very, very difficult topic, this, guys. So as we've done in relation to heroin topics before... We are going to take into account the sensitivity of the subject. We're going to avoid moral panic. We're going to stay steer clear of any kind of scenario about neonat neonatal intensive care units in general. And we don't want to heighten people's anxieties or risk portraying them in a poor light. We're going to do our best to discuss this topic, but obviously we're going to naturally steer away from speculation um, about, you know, let be herself and you know why she did these things or you know what might happen in any appeal because we simply don't know we're going to try and keep it quite narrow in terms of the social work specifics of this one and the relative links to our profession we're not doing that because we don't understand the validity of discussing the wider issues and we understand that some people may want to speculate and discuss that we're doing that out of sensitivity and knowing what we don't know that makes sense, Tilly? Yeah, it does. So, let's start with this one. Lucy Letby worked on a ward that was significantly understaffed. We know that. We know it was significantly understaffed. The hospital had a number of issues in its inspection directly prior to this case, and it was perhaps even more focused on matters away from safety of patients. So what you've got here is you've got staffing pressures combined with Lucy Letby's own seniority. And there could potentially have been a significant concerns for backlash from her. Because in terms of that power imbalance, in terms of, let's put this in a social work context. You've got a relatively senior nurse who's well-liked, well-liked and seemingly dedicated to the job. There were concerns being raised about her. But can you afford to lose her when you don't have much staff anyway? It's understaffed. It was so understaffed, in fact, I'm just reading this from the notes that our producer put together. The ward was notably understaffed and busy at points with one incidence of a baby being left four hours without fluids due to those pressures in his example. The need for experienced nurses was high, but the need for nurses in general was much so. The unit only had capacity for 16 children, however, was treating 18 children at the time of two attempted murders. So, can we draw parallels from the overburdened workforce, the underfunded and understaffed workforce, things that are so critical, such as an infant baby being left four hours without fluids, can we see how this parallels with what happens in social work? Yes. I mean, there are many parallels. We only have to look at, from my perspective, from adults um, being in care homes or in supported living settings, harm is more likely to occur in units where they're understaffed mm -hmm. and where there are additional pressures, staff cut corners, um, sometimes because the, no, through, through no fault of their own, they, they want to provide the care but just physically can't. We see a lot of safeguarding issues where adults have missed medication, they're not, their personal care needs aren't met, missed meals, drinks, all things like that. When units are so underfunded mm. and understaffed and we have a chronic issue in this country, well, not just in this country, across the, around the world about people not valuing care, and not seeing it as a valid career mm -hmm. and it's not very well paid and the working conditions are not great at all 
And I think that you, you can certainly draw parallels. We know that those units in adults where there are staffing issues and staffing pressures, harm is more likely to occur. We get a lot more safeguarding referrals for those sorts of settings. And are we also talking about conditions where it would be rife for carers to assault and harm elderly patients, potentially? Potentially. We have... So I, I know I've been involved in safeguarding issues where staff have been so stretched and just trying to manage a, a busy night shift duty that they've locked people in rooms or or tied people up effectively just to try and keep not from a malicious point of view although it's it's abhorrent practice and it should never ever happen but they were just trying to do the best that they could with what they had and if what else got. could you do with that time and yeah. and, and and that's a, a very difficult difficult scenario to unpick because because what can you do when you are so if you're the only member of staff on and you've got a, a home of 30 residents and they're all needing help at the same time what what do you do no one could be effective at managing that situation um, and I'm not saying that their their behavior is excusable but you can you can have some empathy there certainly some understanding I mean, look, we're, we do have to highlight that there's a naturally a significant difference between, you know, some of the things we've said there and, and murdering children. Of I think course. we have to be very, very yeah. clear. Yeah. So when we're drawing out these parallels, we're not looking at like for like, we're looking at the no. conditions being rife for these issues. But, um, <clears throat> you know, what, what we're looking about here is we're looking at three incidences of significant harm occurring in a very short period and being raised and nothing being done about that. If that happened on a single social worker's caseload, if a single social worker had three incidences of significant harm, would that have been flagged sooner? Do you think that such mismanagement of that by senior figures, which is what it looks like, let's get this right, do you think that would have as readily been able to happen in social work as it did in nursing here with Letby? like to hope not mm. but I think you said at the beginning about hospitals being an, a single institution and they are very closed doors I think that's that's been accepted within yeah. this case and local authorities have a lot more oversight I think um, and, and potentially you've got more people looking and I don't know maybe not I, is, is, is it <laughs> Do we not have to accept that, you know, nurses are seen as inherently good, whereas in social workers are not mm. offered that same sort of high esteem? Because, like, you know, as we spoke about on the podcast last week, everyone was clapping for carers and nurses. Nobody was clapping for social work. No. Now, that's obviously just a, a very small detail in the wider scheme of things. But social workers have a nasty image to many in the public eyes child snatchers or you know mm. sending old people off or not giving them the support they need and so on nurses never have that image at all so is it a sense of nurses are afforded far more leeway and ability to get away with these things simply because they couldn't possibly do that because they're a nurse i think that's a very fair point um and perhaps that was one of the issues in this case but certainly I think it, social work would have much more tighter oversight and scrutiny. I mean, just when I've held cases and when you've held cases as well, I'm sure there was statistics, you were going through them regularly, if you were having good supervision, that is. Or at least there were people that were looking at your mm. caseload. And too many people at times. Too, too yeah. many. Sometimes yeah. I would have... A manager, a service manager, an auditor, and I'd have team supervision, then I'd have an IRO. At any one time, I could have four people, at least, who could regularly be reviewing my case notes. And it's a cloying pleasure at times, that is. Mm. Yeah, it is. So perhaps that's where it was lacking in this case. Well, let's talk about that then. Should, let's go with this question. Should social work positions be mandatory to safeguard vulnerable individuals in hospitals from professional abuse? Now, this is an extreme one. This is a very extreme one because yeah. it's essentially saying, and this is kind of where Baswell was almost mm -hmm. hinting at, that you know, so there should have been a social work voice here because essentially if you're looking at my field of social work, child protection, well, these were babies who were woefully, woefully 
underprotected yeah. and put at significant risk. So let's have a look at the facts here. And again, I'm taking these notes that our producers pulled up for us. It was first noted that there was a connection between Letby and the collapse and deaths of babies on the 2nd of June 2015, almost a full year before her arrest. Even having removed Letby from the ward, she was reinstated because she launched a grievance. And the only reason additional security measures were put in place, the introduction of CCTV cameras within the nursery, was due to the backlash of those who had raised the concerns in the first place. So after she, because she was going to be reinstated, it wasn't the people reinstating her that said we need security. It was the backlash of people saying this is a concern. If she is coming back, you have to do that. So firstly, I'm going to ask you, should social work positions be mandatory to safeguard vulnerable individuals? But secondly, would a risk assessment or safeguarding processes within a multidisciplinary team have implemented safeguarding measures for those babies sooner? What do you think? Yes and yes. I mean, it's it's our bread and butter. It's what we do every day. And, and I don't see why safeguarding wouldn't include other professionals mm -hmm. if you need to certainly it does in adults we regularly have safeguarding investigations raised by carers other professionals um people that are looking after vulnerable people i i don't understand why that's not the case in children's services um, but does that does that not create it might so okay put it this way how would you feel if there was a nurse in your team keeping an eye on you I think you have to take yourself out. How would you feel? Not I, think, how would you feel? Genuinely wouldn't bother me. I don't think I've got nothing to hide in my practice and you can audit me, you can do whatever. Okay, so they've, got, they've come from a very different professional background, very different, and you know how you've worked with many people in yeah, the Yeah, I, I supervise a nurse now. Go. I, I've got But you, you know that team. our professional basis is very different. Mm-hmm. You know, that difference between the objective and the subjective, the art and the science can often, you know, the me well, the, me mm. the medical model and the social model. Yeah. So there's a very different, there's a very different way of approaching clients from a medical model and a social model. In your field, those two sit a lot closer than they do in child protection. They do, They sit yes. a lot closer yeah. in adults because the vast majority of people you work with will very likely have medical, physical yeah. or mental health issues as well. Yes, they do. Social work, yeah, you could maybe say a high proportion of clients have, have mental health issues, but generally low level, depression, mm -hmm. anxiety, medicated by doctors, maybe some talking therapies, you're not talking about hospitalisation yeah. in the vast majority of cases. And again, the vast majority of cases, you're not talking about significant physical issues. If they are, it's generally self-harm through alcohol or drug abuse. I think in my field of work, it would be a cloying pressure upon social workers to think there's a nurse keeping an eye mm. on us because we're the risk and we're the danger. So I worry about that. I also worry that there is the potential for this to be viewed as being able to have prevented murders. Yeah. And then, you, well, how often does this happen? Let's have a look. How many times have you and I sat on this podcast and talked about a child being murdered by their parents and social workers get the blame? So many times. Let's, let's imagine this scenario. There is a social worker in that hospital. Letby gets away with killing seven children. What is the narrative about today, if that's the case? It's going to completely change, isn't it? What was that social worker doing? Why didn't they stop her? Bingo. So it's not going to be about Letby. It's going to be about no. the social worker. And look, this is this may very well end up with now it's going to be a statutory inquiry into mm -hmm. this case. We may very well see that the narrative moves away from Letby did this to senior management allowed this to happen. See yeah. who, who reinstated her. As soon as the name comes out of those people who reinstated her, well, there was one who was moved around, wasn't he? Yes. He was moved to London and so on, moved to a different position, wrote a blog about it, said he was forced out. But these, I, I think there's a potential for these people. I mean, let's have a look at Sharon Sue Smith. So Sharon mm -hmm. Sue Smith was the director of children's services when um, you know Peter Connolly, known as Baby P, was killed by his, you know, um, stepfather and mother and uh, stepfather's boyfriend, uh, stepfather's brother. To this day, Sharon Shoesmith, you know, a decade and a half on, her name's still known. Most of our listeners who are in Britain will, will know that name. Mm -hmm. um, more people could probably name her than they could all three of the killers of Peter Connolly. Yeah. And that is what I worry about situations like this, is that the blame would be placed on professionals, not on the heinous acts of someone like Letby. So I am concerned about that. But I suppose then... Is that a, 
a reason not to do it and and not have a social work expertise in that's in that sort of situation it's not a reason not to do it but it's a reason to tackle it and take that blame culture away because we need i mean it's it's, it's a pernicious culture which pervades every aspect of social work the blame culture that you're you're you are to blame as a social worker for the actions of other people because you mm. didn't you didn't spot it yeah not all the cases you did spot not the thousands of children whose life you made better but that one you got wrong yeah it's a lot of pressure to have. Adding the pressure of being the only social worker in a nursing team, adding the pressure of senior management here, I mean, let's get this right, you know, would the safeguarding process have actually helped because we don't have a framework to address this? When concerns were raised anyway within the hospital, they were dismissed and she was reinstated. Mm-hmm. So if you've got senior figures within the hospital who are squashing this anyway because yeah. they don't want to let let be go mm-hmm. and they don't believe she could do such a thing, if they're not listening to their own members of staff on the front line who come from the same organisation and the same professional background, what chances has a social worker got who's embedded there as part of a trial scheme? Yeah, it it will be a very difficult post. That's my concern. Yeah, and I think that's a, a valid concern. I just feel like that shouldn't be a reason why we don't ex- at least explore it. Because, um, I mean looking at it from an adult's perspective mm-hmm. we do have those mdts that that do this what's that explain that terminology oh multidisciplinary teams Thank sorry you. i know you don't like acronyms do you that's well list of, well i don't like i i'm not buying acronyms but i i do like our listeners being informed and educated in case they yeah. don't okay fair think enough. about our listeners not me. fair enough i never think it. about i never think about, I'm, I'm never thinking about just myself i always think about others like the listeners of course so in adults we have a lot of multidisciplinary teams known mm. as MDTs, and we're involved in all sorts of, of safeguarding investigations where there is alleged abuse that's going on within organisations or within care homes or, or even hospitals, I suppose. That social work role is quite embedded, and I think social work just brings a different perspective that some of the other professions don't have and, and other professions bring in something else that's unique that social workers don't have and I think you need that mix of skills and backgrounds when you're dealing with such complex issues and safeguarding I think that's just should be a given perspective I, I, I don't see why it's not in children's but why why are we precious enough to think that only a social worker could do that? Why couldn't the nurse safeguard and lead simply enact the same rules? Surely it doesn't take a social worker to spot the writing on the wall in this case. So that's the beauty of having a multidisciplinary team. You're having all sorts of professionals. Social workers bring one thing, nurses bring others, occupational therapists, psychologists, doctors, whoever it is, they're all bringing something different and that's a really powerful team then you're you're getting the best of everyone what does this say to parents so we know i read out at the start of the podcast that one in seven children will end up in a you know one one in seven babies will end up in a neonatal intensive care unit more than more than will be involved Mm -hmm. in those one in ten involved with social care one in seven children be in this situation what would it say to parents that Oh yeah, we've got a, we have a social worker on these wards, not to really keep an eye on you as parents, not for the safeguarding of the baby, but to protect the baby from nurses. I mean, you look. What you would do is, of course, of course, because that that job as a social worker, you wouldn't have enough work to occupy yourself. Yeah. You'd need to you'd need to encompass that social work role within the hospital. So, yeah. if I was doing this, I would say, right, we're going to have a social worker in that in every hospital, in every children's ward, we're going to have an embedded social worker. Their job's twofold. Firstly, to look after the welfare of babies on child protection, do discharge plans. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at um, removal at birth, you're looking at how you can navigate that, how you can, you know, signpost mothers to services like PAWS and so on, how you can be involved in helping the care proceedings, doing statements and so on. So there's definitely a role here. There's a role here. I'm not arguing against there being a role here. In fact, I think that role would be very, very useful. My concern is if this role is shoehorned in off the back of we have to keep an eye on the nurses. Now, if that's one aspect mm-hmm. of the role, if that's one aspect of the job, that's fine. Yeah. It's one aspect of the job, that's okay. Yeah. But if that's the only aspect of the job, what does that say to parents that mm. we've got somebody in this hospital whose job it is is to keep an eye on those nurses? 
Yeah, and that's where you've got to have some tact around the development of the role. Yeah. It's got to be about part of it is about quality of practice and quality of care and auditing and making sure that any safeguarding issues or any concerns are raised and addressed appropriately. Mm -hmm. But then you've got those other sides that the social workers should be embedded in hospitals in children's and adult services. And I don't understand why this pull to, to bring social workers out of hospitals, which is what we've seen in adult services over the last three or four years in this country people have tried to get social workers out of hospitals whereas they used to be really embedded I mean I've done a lot of my practice has been based in hospitals I've I've based myself in my man you were peripatetic you were in hospital I, almost I every day weren't you most of the time yeah. majority of my placements I spent quite a, a while based in accident and emergency department um, just dealing with any of the social work issues that came through mm. the door and that was really powerful because you would then be part of that nursing team and that that welfare check when anyone came in they, and you would be part of your you're straight away you're looking at discharge or how can we get people out of of a and e without getting them admitted onto the ward if at all possible yeah. and anything that arose that would be a social work role so if it was like that and that's how it was badged and sold to people then i think that's a really powerful role um and i think that should happen in the children's wards just as it used to in the adults and this is the problem with the constant drive for change in social work there are many senior figures whose job it is to have to change and tinker with things this simply yeah. is that's someone's mm. job if you're yeah. in a certain seniority in social work you have to pass off the illusion of change otherwise what you do when you've always got to have a plan you've always got to have an idea to fix things yeah so even sometimes if things aren't broken well, I can make that better. And that's yeah. why we have this cycle. I mean, I've been in some social work, children's services departments where we've had low quality working. We'll go back to central working. Oh, but then we'll go back to low quality working. It's, it, it boggles. No, no, no new ideas in social work, isn't it? That's you know, that would be the social work Luddite. Mm. The SWL. Um, let's end on this one. Look, systemic failures and toxic cultures have resulted in poor decisions making by senior management and danger to patients in this situation. Inevitably, inevitably we know mm -hmm. the systemic failures, we know there's been toxic cultures, and we know that that's combined to lead to poor decision making by senior management. Evidently poor decision making, and this will come out in the wash in relation to the statutory um investigation so i'm just going to read out some details that we know about this one we know the concerns raised by doctors were dismissed and we know that this culture has noticed there's a significant barrier to raising concerns with doctors effectively silenced on this one concerns raised to senior management about Letby's connection to the babies who fell unwell and her presence being noted within each case were dismissed with a view that she was the one being victimized you are victimizing Letby on this case so they're dismissed why are you picking on this woman these were dismissed in part due to a defensive culture. So a defensive culture was identified that, you know, well, you know, we're going to look after her. You know, how dare you do this? We're going to, we're not even going to consider this. We're going to, right, this is our way. Bang, we're going to put up those walls. The involvement of external agencies was delayed due to a wish to preserve the reputation. How does that sound? To, let's read that one out. We didn't want other people coming and looking because we wanted to preserve the reputation of the organisation. Where have we heard that one before? Oh, and the last one dear. is we have to look at could having an accessible yet independent multidisciplinary team, as you've mentioned, prevent this or would this continue irrespective of this? So let's consider that sort of difference in culture between social work and the NHS. You know, social workers, we as individual social workers are more likely to be scapegoated than defended with the view to protect the reputation of the local authority. So that's a bit different here, because if you think in social work, okay, how many times are social workers who perceived to have been failures thrown under the bus? Tale as old as time, isn't it? Yes, that's, it is that's... a tale as old as time. All the time, that happens. And yet that didn't happen here. No. Letby was protected. Mm. So in social work, the culture you tend to get is we will sacrifice our social workers to preserve the reputation. Here, what you're seeing is we will shield let be an individual worker to protect the reputation. 
why are we looking at two professions similarly held in terms of you know the professional registration the degree qualification needed and so on the wages are similar there's a lot of similarities between nursing and, and social work across mm-hmm. the board why are we looking at two professionals and how a social worker would be treated so differently a social worker would be let go for not keeping the case notes up to date and yet Letby was allowed to get away with what she did why a two professional is treated so differently i think it comes back to the values of social work versus nursing nurses are held in higher regard i think they're 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 valued by society social workers aren't no one wants to blame a nurse for anything do they whereas social mm-hmm. workers we're bad we're evil we're we're out to out to, to cause you. out to get you or out to cause problems mm-hmm. meddling and, yeah and nurses aren't I think there is a difference between local authority culture and the NHS cultures, though, as well. What's more dangerous, that. though? What's more dangerous? Well, they're, they're, they're both equally as dangerous, I think. It's, you're, you're both covering up failures. Is there an argument that letting social workers go and putting them under the bus so easily at least protects our clients because we're no longer there to harm them through overt actions or through poor practice but it doesn't tackle the issues it doesn't that tackle the issue but that. does it does it at least rip the rose up by its roots i mean from an image point of view it, it it sits more comfortably with society doesn't it that bad apple is gone get rid of them whereas that it doesn't address the causes of why failure was allowed to happen in the first place or what caused failure perceived failure but does it, in fact, sort of prevent accountability and meaningful change, meaning lessons will be learned, will all the other be a saying? Because if we're going to say, OK, you know, lessons will be learned, lessons will be learned, but we always kind of let those people go and we don't protect, you know, how mm-hmm. how can you bring about meaningful change if your result is either as an organisation to defend your staff, no matter what, or as an organisation your stances to never defend them let them go and blame them how do you pitch it within the middle and ensure that you can you know really learn those lessons and make difference so you you will obviously if a worker's doing anything at anywhere near the level levy they've got to go of course they have but if a worker makes a mistake how do you find that balance between protecting them but also protecting the organization where's that balance found well, does anyone have the answer to that, you really? You do, that's why I've asked the question. <laughs> I, I think it, you, you can't, there is no answer because that, it is a really hard fine line to, to tread. I don't, I don't think you can verbalise that. It's, a, it's about having a culture in an organisation where it's not a blame culture. It's mm. a, an open, transparent one of learning, one of support and development. And... I don't know if that can be quantified. We know that there are millions and millions of pounds spent within uh, litigation on these situations, so it it can be a significant concern in relation to that. And I I just worry that if that happens, then we could end up in a similar position in social work, and that's my biggest concern. That is my biggest worry on this one. If that happens, then if social workers were facing the culture that our clients could sue us for failings and the local and occasionally it can happen very very occasionally usually to do with foster care and uh, care proceedings but if we were facing the same legal scrutiny in the same position of millions and millions of pounds i worry that we could that culture could come in with us could it not i think it could Right, that's a heavy one, so we're going to keep the podcast a little bit shorter this week simply because there was so much we could go into this one, but we just wanted to pull a couple of threads out there and give you guys a couple of conversation points because it's uh, it's such a harrowing story. And, of course, you know, I want to finish this by offering our condolences to family members of the victims. You know, we, we do recognise that not only it was the family members of the victims and the babies themselves, but, of course, we want to recognise the nurses and doctors in the NHS that were affected us too. Uh, We do understand the professional-wide impact of such situations and we do show solidarity with all the other nurses in the world who would never even dream of doing this kind of thing. So we know it's a very sensitive topic. We hope we've handled it as best we can and we shall leave it there. Right. Until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me.